right, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Wide awake, enjoying this dark at 6 o'clock and getting ready to leave the house. We usually uh, leave a sheer curtain closed for our dogs so they can still have some daylight. I said, it's all right, dark outside. Let's just close the curtains up. <laughs> well, you got to love this. Is this daylight savings time or is that the spring when they call it daylight savings time? That's spring, okay. This is no more daylight, all dark, early in the daytime, right? Well, praise the Lord, guys. We're going to get started here in just a moment. We're missing a few folks tonight. Uh, Dick and Marcia said they weren't going to get back in town today to be able to be here in time for this. Um, uh, Bruce had some vehicle problems today in dealing with that, so I know they're not going to be able to be here either. And again, thanks to chip for helping us out getting this recorded and getting it loaded up the next day on youtube uh, some folks have already said they'll be joining this on youtube catching it tomorrow as soon as possible and today is chip's birthday happy birthday, happy birthday. he decided to come spend his birthday up here with us today amen happy all right brenda you got my you got my handouts uh brenda i got i do have some handouts i'm going to get brenda or somebody to go ahead and pass those out and all it is I'll, I'll let you get it, and I'll tell you kind of what that is here in, in just a moment. <laughs> we'll get everybody to get a copy of the notes, and we'll take a moment to open up in prayer. Believe in God to show us something tonight. I hope you are too. She was too busy getting her name wrote on the board for talking in school. So. We talked about that one time before. I was always the name taker. The teacher would be like, who wants to take names? Yeah, I'll take names. Is this too loud? I'm listening to it. Is, that, is this a little bit loud in here tonight? I can a little bit only because there are nothing. Brenda or Todd, Todd, could you go just maybe just take the right hand to master volume and bring it down just just a little bit it's just since we don't have that many people in here tonight sounds a little echoey see what we needed was another 50 or 60 people in here then it wouldn't have been too loud okay just a little bit check that out one two three check right there i think that's good thank you todd i appreciate you doing that all right so let's uh, go ahead and let's open up in prayer and let's do this. If you got a prayer request tonight, let's get in agreement. How many people's got some something, somebody that you're praying for? Praying for praying for your church, praying for your family, praying for your country. Amen. Um, lots to pray for. Um, pray for a part of my prayer this week and through study time is praying for understanding. Praying for taking that another level to revelation. I'm believing for the Holy Spirit to shake some people and give them revelation. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we bless you. We give you glory and praise tonight as we come together in your name, Lord. As we come together, Lord, to, to share the word, uh, to, to learn more about the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Lord, the more about our lives being used for you in the work of ministry in the places that you have called each of us to be. We pray tonight, God, again, for understanding. We pray for revelation. We pray for lives to be changed, Lord. We pray for a church to be equipped and ready to go out into the world to make a difference for you and your kingdom, Lord. We pray also tonight, Lord, for the needs and the hands that have been raised tonight, Lord, and every need. Lord, we just pray in agreement, Lord, for you to move quickly. We know that there are some great needs within our body of believers. We know that there are people that... Um, uh, still healing from surgeries and surgeries that are pending, Lord. And we just believe, Lord, for great things to take place. So, God, we pray tonight for, again, this time, our study time, to just be, Lord, let us just hone in and let us focus in on the parts that we need to and, and let us receive from you tonight, Lord. And we just pray, Holy Spirit, have your way and, and minister to us as only you can. And we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so just ahead of time, I'll jump ahead of my notes a little bit. Um, I know we have some people that have the same Bible. It's a great Bible. It's a Nelson Publishers. It's the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. It's a study Bible centered around the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I highly recommend if you do not have one of these Bibles, get yourself one. Melissa, I know has got one. Uh, the notes that you received tonight, all this is is a section 
from the back of the Bible here that's about the Holy Spirit. There's just some great study materials in here on the Holy Spirit. And tonight, I'm going to be using some of that directly. Um, I have two copies of this in the Bible, and I also have a digital copy that I use on my iPad and my computer. So I, I, I did copy and pasting and resizing for you guys today so y'all could have this to take home and study later. Uh, but again, I, I, if you, won't, you won't regret getting a copy of this. If you... Um, for your smart device or your computer, you can download this from your iTunes store, or I guess Google has the same thing, and it's pretty neat the way the electronic copy works as far as moving around on it, but I suggest you get you a copy of this. It, it, it can really help you in your studies. But we'll get back to that in just a minute, but um, last week, again, we started talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, amen, baptism of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. And then we got to the part about that, talking about with evidence of speaking in tongues. And oftentimes, as, as we've seen in our lives, when we start talking about baptism and the Holy Ghost and speak, evidence of speaking in tongues, some people, I, it kind of weirds people out, and people uh, don't like to hear about it, don't like to talk about it, but we will continue to talk about it. Amen. And we're, we're, we're going to continue to look at the Bible. And... Um, but I feel as though we couldn't just stop where we were last week. I know we're all ready to get into the gifts of the Spirit. I am too. Um, I've been I've been kind of struggling, not struggling, but torn this week as far as should I jump straight into the gifts or just praying and seeking God because I just feel like we needed more of this. And um, again, it's so important that we can't rush this. We, we have to have understanding about it. We, um, we don't want any confusion over this whatsoever. Uh, we started off talking about church doctrine. We started talking about the articles of faith and laying it out, what our church is, who we are, what we believe. Amen? Um, that's probably, you will notice, um, is has been and will continue to be probably more clear to people than maybe it has been in the past. We've been in a season when I know God has had us ministering to different people from diverse backgrounds and uh, we just believe that this is a time that God wants us to uh, introduce people to the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So again, this is why I'm also being so careful to make sure that everything is back with Scripture. Amen. It has to be back with Scripture. Our doctrine has to be back with Scripture. What we teach has to be back with Scripture. Sometimes when I'm preparing for Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights, I find myself I have to tap the brakes because I want to give you so much Scripture that we just literally don't have time for it. But it has to be back with Scripture. But I want to just kind of open up with something today. Um, everybody has dreams and everybody has goals and this and that. Uh, one of my wife's dreams is to go to the Grand Canyon. Yep. And um, and I hope to see that dream come true sometime in our near future. And to visit the Grand Canyon and see it ourselves. And we've seen pictures. And I know some of y'all have been to how many people in here have been to the Grand Canyon? Everybody except for me and Brenda, not not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know we we've seen the pictures, we've heard the personal accounts of people who have been there. Uh, one person told us, we asked, well, what did you think about it? It was simple. It's just a big hole. <laughs> that was one perspective. One person said it's just a big hole, but other people say it's the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. Even to the place people say it has literally changed their life to see this in person and how grand it is. But the one common thing is everybody says you have to experience it for yourself in order to appreciate it, Right. And that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. If, I, if I've got a title that can't be explained, must be experienced. And I don't really have a ton of notes. But um, this is where the Holy Spirit was leading me as far as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So looking for some words of wisdom to introduce this teaching, I, I did what any good preacher would do in the year 2022. I asked the Google. Yeah. And I started trying to find some quotes on you know around this can't be explained must be experienced i found a couple of quotes i wanted to share with you the first one says some things can't be explained this is part of the magic of life there cannot be a word or an idea or a definition attached to everything some things just have to be experienced right, That's right. and that was from a a very wise person named jim james I had no idea who Jim James was, and I always like to know who I'm talking about before I 
shared her quotes and and he's actually some obscure rock and roll guy that's kind of famous for his one-liners and stuff he's not even from a well-known band or anything but i thought it was kind of cool i read some stuff about it. the next one i wanted to read this comes from dean william f tracy he's from the university of wisconsin i, I go deep when i'm looking for stuff okay and he says, outstanding teachers in our college will tell you that there are many ways to reach the eager minds in our classrooms. An illuminating lecture, a probing question, or a well-designed experiment all can spark our students' intelligent ambition. But nothing generates a more powerful or lasting response than firsthand experience. Amen. So again, experience. Guys, I, I really wish that there was some way that I had it within me the ability to explain the baptism of the Holy Ghost that your average person who's never experienced it or been exposed to it was, could just grab it and say, I want that and I want that in my life right now. Amen. Myself and a whole bunch of other Pentecostal pastors wish that they had the same thing. And a lot of evangelists who wish that they had the same thing. That they could go into a group of people who have not been exposed to this line of teaching and give them a one or two line example and have the altars lined up. People ready and hungry, ready to be filled with the Holy Ghost, amen, but it's just not that easy sometimes, so the Pentecostal baptism in the Holy Ghost is definitely an experience, and until a person has this experience, there will not be a complete understanding, that's my testimony, it made no sense to me, until I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then it made perfect sense, amen. Um, I'm sure most of y'all could testify the same thing to folks here who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I've said this, talking to some folks, I had I had to fight the battle of my mind before I could receive it. But, uh, but here's the thing. It's hard to explain. It has to be experienced. Yet tonight I'm challenged with the need to explain it to you guys as well as part of the idea behind this is having this recorded on our YouTube channel for later viewing. So there will be people that are watching this and hearing some of our discussion as they're watching this later and we want to package this on a playlist so we can refer people to this later but we have people who have not been exposed to this and say well look why don't you go watch this series of teachings we believe is something that will help you amen, amen. so uh, trying to figure out how to explain it a few of you guys were here a few years ago probably three years ago may have been four years ago now i was um i started a series and i started talking about guacamole Okay, and it found out. So I did a lot of studying about guacamole, and I found out people either like guacamole or they don't like guacamole. All right, how many people in here like guacamole? Okay. How many How many people in here don't like guacamole? Okay. So here's the. I'm going to I'm going to jump right in. Of you people who raised your hand and said you don't like guac, don't like guacamole, how many of you have never tried guacamole? Okay. <laughs> This, this is exactly, this, this is my point. And God, let, let, me, let me tell you, I am, not, I am not smart enough to come up with something like this on my own. This was the Holy Spirit that gave me this illustration to use guacamole for the same reason so many people are not baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay? People just don't, they say they don't like it based on the appearance or the perception. And they've made their decision that they don't like it without trying it. On something that they have personally never experienced. You've never experienced guacamole. I didn't like guacamole until I tried guacamole. And I love guacamole. Amen. I bought a fresh ripe avocado today. You take you an avocado. You take you two tomatillos. You chop those up with a little bit of onion, some garlic, a little lime juice. You throw that in the blender and get you some chips. Mm -hmm. It's good. Forget what color it is. <laughs> Just because it's green, can I, you know, we're real, okay? You know, I talk to people in the South. Here's what people say. It looks like baby poop. <laughs> That's what they say. That looks like something out of a baby's diaper. I ain't going to eat that. That sounds good. You need to try it. Amen. But again, I was a skeptic until I tried it. So the point of my illustration was the perception of the Holy Spirit and His working through the church today. And my prayer through this study in detailed presentation many people will soon have transformed lives being filled with filled with and operating in the gifts of the holy spirit because this world needs it now 
Yes. Right now. It's been it's been long enough. This it needs it. So tonight, again, I've got your notes for you. I think everything we're going to need is going to be in those notes tonight. I may pop around and read some scriptures up here. I'm going to try to be cautious of the time because if I try to read all of the scriptures, you'll notice in your notes there's a lot of little scriptures in there. Um, I'm going to use my iPad for tonight because I can click on those scriptures and it pops up and I can read them. So that's a nice thing about this. But I'm going to read through, uh, read through and discuss a section from this study Bible that I talked about. And I made sure on your notes that there is a, a notation at the end giving credit to the book where it comes from. And if you want to get yourself a copy, ChristianBooks.com has them. And they were on sale. I don't know if they still are or not, but it's a great Bible. Um, I strongly suggest getting yourself one of these. And I believe the written study and help will help break some understanding. So let's go ahead, if you've got your notes there, I'm going to start reading this, and I, honestly, this is spirit-led tonight, and that scares some of y'all, because y'all know that I go for a long, lot longer if I'm not reading, reading notes. So I just breathed and took a big sip of water, amen. I made sure I got two cups of coffee tonight when I got here. So this is written by uh, Paul Walker, and his Holy Spirit gifts and power, and I'm just going to read this, and you can read along with me. I'm doing it. Can I explain why I'm doing this? I, I like to make I like to just go through something and dissect it, take my part, write it myself, so I can just give it to you my wording, but I can't do it as good as what this person has done. What is put together here is so good that I just wanted to read it to you. It's not typically how I like to do it, but without a doubt, the Pentecostal revival of the early 1900s and the charismatic renewal which had its beginning in the late 1950s, together constitute one of the most innovative and impactful spiritual renovations in history. But when we investigate this phenomenon, we must ask, number one, why is this happening? Number two, what is this doing? And number three, how can spiritual integrity be maintained? All these are important points, and we're going to discuss all these. Pastor Mark, you need a copy? Come on down. You ain't got to hide about there. Get Pastor Mark a copy of this. So we're going to go through this and we're going to talk a little bit about it as we go through. The first section on this, it says, uh, why has this happened? And we're just going to read, read a little bit on here. The first reason has been an evident, an evident need for a renewal of mission and purpose throughout the church and among its individual members. Amen. Guys, I, I'm, I don't know if we'll get through all this tonight because I just have to, um, I have to go through this and talk about it as I hit it. There is an evident need for renewal of mission and purpose throughout the church and among its individual members. Amen. There's a purpose for the church. There's a purpose for you yeah. coming to church. There's a purpose for the Rock Worship Center being at 3405 on Charlotte Highway. And it goes beyond having service at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings and 7 o'clock on, on, on Wednesday nights. Amen. There's more. This is a place where we are supposed to come together and be equipped and empowered to go out into the world and make a huge difference for the kingdom of God. Amen. And we all have a part to play in that. And we're going to talk about the spiritual gifts, how we all have different gifts, but it takes us all coming together. But we need to renew. For a long time, the church has just been what it is. You know, we talked a little bit about the Pentecostal churches grew out of the Methodist churches. And go back into church history, it's like the Pentecostals coming out and said the Methodist churches at the day and time were just about ice cream socials and Sunday dinners. And that was what they spent all their time was, oh, let's, let's plan this social. Let's plan. And we got to be careful. We fall into that. We're planning fall festival. We're planning where's the women's ministry going to go out and eat. We're planning what time is the men's breakfast. And, you know, this is the thing we're doing. But we have to be careful. Men's breakfast has a purpose. Amen. We're supposed to be out there letting our light shine before people to make a difference in Christ. The women's Bible study is supposed to be connecting with people. Hallelujah. Our fall festival is our fall festival's supposed to reach the lost. So there's got to be a purpose with this. Amen. Was anybody happy with our turnout for Fall Festival this year? I wasn't. We didn't have nearly enough people this year. Amen. And I think I knew all but two of them. <laughs> so, you know, we're hoping for more people to show up. But the first reason is evident. There's a need for the renewal of mission and purpose throughout the church and amongst individual members. You have a purpose. I have a purpose. Your purpose is different than mine. You know, Honestly, my calling is to be a pastor in the church. I, I'm here to equip you. Okay? 
I spent a lot of time on social media and all that stuff trying to get people to come to the church. Amen. Some of y'all need to pick that kind of stuff up. I talk to people in Walmart and I invite them to church. Some of y'all need to pick that stuff up. You know, these did different things. There's, there's things about what's your ministry and how do you do it. Second, in view of the need for renewal, there has been a definite movement on the part of sincere believers to recover the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit, which transformed and empowered early Christians. Amen. This is where the Pentecostal revival came in because people were tired of just being a church with no power. They were tired of reading about power, but they didn't have any power. Can I get an amen on that? And I don't want to just keep preaching to y'all about power. I want to see y'all operating in power. Amen? But we need to get back. This is talking about getting back. Getting back to the first century church. Getting back to Pentecost. Getting back to the book of Acts. Getting back when thousands were being added to the church daily. Getting back when, when hundreds of people were getting filled with the Holy Ghost. When people were just lined up and, and a shadow fell upon people and they got healed. Amen? When we sent prayer cloths out to somebody's house and they got healed. Amen? I'm just going to be transparent. We were moving some furniture around the mat's room and changing some beds out and I lifted the mattress up and Brenda said, oh, I'm glad he didn't see that. I forgot. I put that prayer cloth up under there a long time ago. But hey, hallelujah. If you ain't got prayer cloths up under your children's mattress, you should have. Amen. And we need to be believing and believing for lives to be transformed with this. But again, we need to recover that dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. It empowered, empowered the early Christians. I'm going to read on. Emerging from this movement has been an inbreaking. That's their word, inbreaking in here. And it's like best I can tell it's not actually even a real word. It's more, more or less the infilling, but it's kind of like, like broken into. Like the Holy Spirit just comes in and occupies. So that's just that's infilling. But emerging from this movement has been an inbreaking of the Holy Spirit accompanied by speaking in tongues among believers in every major denomination. Demonstrating that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a denomination or movement, but an experience that brings endowment of spiritual power for intensified service. Amen. This is not... This is not reserved for a denomination or denominations of believers. This is for the body of Christ. This is, this is Jesus' plan. This is the will of God to have an empowered church, people filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? But we look at this, and this is what it says. It's, it's supposed to draw everybody together. But instead, it seems like it pulls people apart. But it's um, inside the church, intensified service, and just filling us for what we need to do. But the third thing says this inbreaking of the Holy Spirit has linked both the mainline Protestant and traditional Pentecostal movement to the worship practices of the first century. Through what has appropriately been referred to as the charismatic movement, derived from charismata, the Greek word used for the example in Corinthians 12, 4, 4 and 30, which we're going to get to those. Y'all just hold on, I'm going to read this for you real quick. Um, First Corinthians 12 and 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. So we start looking at spiritual gifts. It's just all about spiritual gifts. We're, and we're going to be studying the gifts of the spirit. But here's the thing. This, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this power of the Holy Spirit, this is, again, it's supposed to bring us together. It's not supposed to pull us apart. But unfortunately, as soon as we start talking about speaking in tongues, something happens and, and it creates confusion. And I don't think the confusion is coming from this side. Okay, let's read again. We're going to be very careful to go through this over and over and over when we start looking at tongues. I'm going to, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to give you notes beyond a certain point on here. If you've got the Bible, you can go and read it. The next thing is talking about two types of tongues that we'll be talking about intensely. But what is this doing? This is, this is what's the big thing. Renewal then raises the question, what really happens when the gifts go to the church? This is big. What's the purpose of it? What happens when the church receives these gifts? Um, in attempting to answer, attention must be given to the scriptural foundations on the traditional context and the contemporary witnesses. Um, so the first thing is scripture is being fulfilled. What we're seeing, when we start seeing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and we see people filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and operating in the gifts of the Spirit, is scripture being fulfilled? Is prophetic word being fulfilled? Um... First, the Bible unequivocally declares, be filled with the Spirit. And that comes from Ephesians 5 and 18. I'm going to read that verse for you. And do not be drunk with wine, which is in dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Um, does that sound pretty clear? 
Be filled with the Spirit. It's pretty direct. And re this is part of the reason I just copied this and gave it to you because this breaks down all the verbiage and all this. So listen to this. An, an, an analysis of the Greek verb translated be filled shows that, shows that it is in the present tense indicating that this blessing is one that we may experience and enjoy now. Amen. It's for today. Can it, it's for today. This is the way it's written to us. It wasn't just for first century church. It's also for us today. Okay? Um, the fact that the verb is a command, it means it's in the imperative mode. I'm telling you all, see, I'm, I, I don't remember all this grammar stuff from high school. I wasn't paying attention. So that's the reason I'm going to rely on somebody that was smarter than me and that, that they, they can give you all this stuff. Y'all, I can't remember how to diagram a sentence. Anybody here remember how to diagram a sentence from school? Oh, Jerry, you can. I know you can. I, I can find the verbs and the pronouns. Pronouns are a big thing this day and time, so it's pretty easy to identify those. Except now they're all interchangeable. Let me, let me get back, okay? All right, so this is a command. Does not leave does not leave the responsive disciple an option in the matter. We're not supposed to have an option. We're supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. However, since the verb is in the passive voice, it is clear that being filled with the Spirit is not something the Christian achieves through his own efforts, but is something that is done for him to which he submits. Hence, the Scripture depicts the theocentric view of the Holy Spirit's filling in which the higher reaches down to gather up the lower into ultimate communion. Clarity, now here, this is important. Clarity on this point dismisses the criticism or misunderstanding of some who seem to see this experience as something merely conjured up by human suggestion, proposition, or excitement. This is what we deal with. This, this, is, this is, if I loosely use the word stigma, that gets associated with Pentecostal and charismatic churches that there were just a bunch of crazy people that just made this stuff up. If you knew me before I got saved, you would never question that I was a person that would make something like this up. And first, second off, what benefit is it to me to lie about something or to make up some kind of conjured up stuff as far as like praying in the spirit, speaking in tongues, prophecies and these different things? But again, when we study this and people actually look at it, they actually try to guacamole instead of just assuming they don't like it. It's a great, it's a great illustration, I'm telling you. You'll, you'll get that. Now you've got to go to the Mexican restaurant. Y'all need, need to go to the Mexican restaurant. Get you some guacamole. Next time you order your chimichanga and they said, you want the guacamole? Don't say no. Just say yes. Bring it on. Amen. <laughs> They always ask us that. We're always, yeah, we want everything. Put it all on there. Bring hot peppers, everything you got. Put it all on there. We're, we're good. Um, but again, there seems to be this misunderstanding. And it's like this idea that the stuff that we're reading in the Bible, directly from the Bible, presenting from the Bible, but it's, it's, people just won't receive it as being from the Bible. Emotionalism. Emotionalism is a, is a thing that now we're going to be we're going to talk about some things in the church also. You know, we're, there, is everything perfect? No, no, no. Um, is emotionalism a real thing? Yeah. Yes, it is. Absolutely. If it wasn't, I wouldn't have five left of retrievers. Okay. So. Oh, they're cute puppies. Let's see. But um, we're just going to get back to this, and we're going to talk a bit more about the the, the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, the person in the work of the Holy, the, the person of the Holy Spirit is at work. Now, I am not going to read all these little scriptures on here. You can go back and read all this stuff later. But second, the Bible reveals that the person of the Holy Spirit has been the primary agent in all the mystery of the Word throughout the centuries. Now, we've talked about this. There's so much evidence in the Old Testament, so we're going to get a little teaching on that in this. Um, the scripture states clearly that the triune Godhead operates co-equally, co-eternally, co-existently as one unit. But it also has been suggested with and with validity that we might view this unity of activity with an eye towards the specific function of each member of the Trinity. The executive is the Father, the architect is the Son, and the contractor is the Holy Spirit. This is probably a little different than you've been taught, but it, it kind of works, I get it. The scriptures show that the Holy Spirit, uniquely and distinctly at work in these roles, he is the author of the Old Testament. And I'm just going to read a couple of these. In 2 Samuel 23 and 2, let me read that one for you. 
Um, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. Okay, so we see the, the Holy Spirit. This is in Samuel's, in the writing of the book here. So this is the recording of it. It's put there. Um, Isaiah 59, 21. Let's look at that one also in Old Testament. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from you, from you, from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants, descendants, says the Lord, from this time forevermore. Amen. That's, that's good reading. You need to go back and read some more of that. But more of that. And said he's also the author of the New Testament. As you go through here and read, and I'll just read one of these, John, um, John 14, 25 and 26. Um, these things I spoke to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. So we see that we just he's still in the New Testament. He's teaching, he's writing through the writings that were coming, were coming through the Holy Spirit. Um, he is the Old Testament anointer. And you see in the Old Testament, we talked about this a little bit. We saw people temporarily empowered through anointing of the Holy Spirit to do specific jobs. It said there are no less than 16 Old Testament leaders in Israel who received this anointing. Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Othniel, Gideon, Japheth, Samson, Saul, David, Elisha, Elisha, Azariah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Micah, and thus the Holy Spirit as contractor anointed the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah and Joel, to write to prophesy the day when he would be outpoured and when his gifts would be exercised in the church throughout the church age as a whole. And we talked about Joel 2, 28-32, where the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Now, in Isaiah 28, 11, and 12, this is something I'm going to go ahead and read this. Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. For with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and it is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Um, so when we read this, I always like this. He said, For God's going to speak to his people with stammering lips and another tongue. So I always like that God's going to speak in tongues to his people in a language that they're not going to understand. I believe unless you have the revelation of this. But God used Isaiah to tell Judah that, that, that he would teach them in a manner they did not like and he would give them knowledge through the language of foreigners as a sign to their unbelief. Okay? Sign to their unbelief. Centuries later, the apostle Paul expands this intent of passage, of the intent of this passage, referring it to the gifts of speaking in tongues and in the church as a manifestation or sign to unbelievers. Let's go into, we're going to go through all this, but let me read 14, uh, 21 and 22. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Um, I was a brand new Christian, got saved, and I was at church probably my second or third time when I heard somebody speaking in tongues. And it caught my attention. It caused me to want to dig deeper. I, I shared this, I think, last week talking about this. So it didn't scare me off. It drew me in. So it's a sign for unbelievers. That's the thing that we have to embrace with this. This sign could be in a language either known or unknown to human beings. And I'm, not, again, not going to read all these scriptures. In all these respects, we see the Holy Spirit as one who operates in the church as a definite personality. A person, a person given as a gift to the church to assure the continued ministry and the resurrect, the continued ministry of the resurrected Christ, and expressed and verified. The Holy Spirit then has all the characteristics of a person. So, see, now that's something we've talked about, and we have to be careful of that we don't we don't uh, negate the Holy Spirit to an it. It's a he, he, third person of the Godhead. Um, You know, it's kind of a joke, and some of you folks have raised Pentecostal or became Pentecostal sometime in your life, and it's like, it's kind of a joke around the altar. Somebody goes down praying for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Somebody says, did you get it? Did you get it? Yeah. Hey, did they get it? It's like, well, you know, so that's a little casual. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about God here. We're talking about somebody that's now been baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's It's not just it. It's He. We can 
talked to the Holy Spirit, prayed to the Holy Spirit. I was on this, I was on this conviction one time that I couldn't pray to the Holy Ghost, and then I was like, God had to break me of that. And I was like, it's God, I can pray to Him. I talk to the Holy Ghost all the time. But um, and some people say I'm crazy because of that. But He possesses the, the attributes of mind. Okay, so we start listening to all this. I'm going to, I'm going to read some of these. Romans eight twenty seven. <coughs> Um, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. So we start thinking about the Holy Spirit as a person. He has a mind. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 11 says, um, but one of the same spirit works all things, distributing to each of the individual as he wills. He engages in such activities as revealing uh, let me go back. I'm just going to go to Ephesians 4.30. Uh, the attributes of the mind and feelings. So Ephesians 4 and 30. This is a big one. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All right. So he has a mind. He's intellectual. He has feelings. How many people here like to have your feelings hurt? How many people like to be talked negatively about? I should. I've got enough experience about it. So. But, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're not supposed to hurt the Holy Spirit's feelings. I mean, to me, you know, just as clear as it can come to me, to think about, I don't want to hurt the feelings of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to hinder a movement of God. I don't want to say anything to offend my God. I don't want to say anything to offend the Holy Spirit. And, and so we start thinking about this. You know, did you ever think about that? I mean, you ever just stop and think the Holy Spirit's got feelings? And you know, I'm going to tell you, in this area, he gets his feelings hurt a lot. Yeah. Because he gets a bad name. Yeah. And there's nothing bad about his name. Hallelujah. Yeah. He engages in such activities as revealing, teaching, witnessing, interceding, speaking, commanding, and testifying. And all of these, we can go through these. Uh, 2 Peter 1.21 in revealing. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so prophecy. We'll probably come back to that when we're talking about the gift of prophecy. That's coming through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, teaching. John 14, 26. We know this. He'll, he'll teach you all things. But the helper of the Holy Spirit who the Father sent in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. I've shared this one before and I want to see if anybody's had this experience. I believe this. He will bring back to your remembrance everything that Jesus said. Everything that Jesus said, we got it recorded in this book. Not everything, but we, we know that from the end of John. But when we read the Bible, it's God's Word. It's Jesus speaking to us. So as we read it, it's somewhere in us. And do y'all remember every word you ever read? But do you have, have you had those moments when you can remember a scripture that you know you never memorized? I've, I've been in church services preaching before and I'll recite a scripture and then I'll go back, when did I memorize that? I, never, I can't tell it to you now. But it was just the Holy Spirit at that moment bringing it back to my remembrance. So the Holy Spirit as a teacher, that's, that's just such a great role that we have with the Holy Spirit. Um, in witnessing, let's look at Hebrews 10, 15. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us after he had said before. So he witnesses to us. Interceding, Romans 8.26. Romans 8.26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray as, pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's such a powerful verse. When I don't know what to pray, Brenda's called, we, we share an office at home now. And she said there one day, I, didn't, I was studying, I think I had headphones on listening to something, and she's like, what are you praying about? Have you been over there praying in tongues for the last five minutes? I was like, I didn't realize I was over there praying, you know. Just, but it's just, I don't know what to pray sometimes. Do you always know what to pray? Do you always know what to pray when somebody asks you to pray for them? But if we don't understand, the Spirit does, and He can give us utterance. And sometimes it's just a groaning. Listen, I've had people condemning talk, speaking in tongues and praying in tongues before. Somebody said, that's just gibberish. Did you hear what that noise was coming out of their mouth? I said, did you, did you read this verse? He makes intercessions for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. It's just not natural things. It's supernatural. 
But thank God for the Holy Spirit in those times willing to intercede for us, uh, speaking, commanding, and testifying. He has a relationship with human persons. Again, he can be grieved. Yeah. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. That's a relationship. You ever had a friend do you wrong? Yeah. Hurts, doesn't it? And as you start thinking, just the Holy Spirit, who he is as a person. Oh, I don't like this one. Lied to. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Let's look at this one. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Can I preach for a moment? Is that okay? There were people that didn't realize this happened until I pointed it out. Do you know that sometimes that, that people will come to a church and take a tithe envelope and seal it and carry it down and put it in a tithe basket and, it's, and there's nothing in it? They'll just walk down with an envelope. And I'm like, I actually, I think I said this one time, listen, if y'all don't do that, please just don't lick it so we can reuse it. Okay? <laughs> At least give us the opportunity we can reuse the envelope because you're not putting your name on it so we know who put it in the envelope in there. But it, it, it happens. And every time I've seen one of those envelopes, I'm like, Lord, I'm just going to intercede for these people right now. Don't strike them dead. Don't strike them dead. I mean, is is there any, is that not just basically lying to God? And he's like, I'm going to go, yes, people are going to watch me come down and put an empty envelope in there. I, I don't know. But lying to the Holy Spirit, go read that, you'll find out it's not good to lie to the Holy Spirit. First, first killed him, then killed her. She come in, hey, where's the Ananias? He did, guess what's fixing to happen to you? You lied too. I mean, I, I know God's just not going around striking people down dead, but I do remind y'all that is New Testament. People talk about, oh, we in disposition of grace, God would never do such a thing. Yeah. That's New Testament. Yeah. That sounds like some Old Testament stuff, but that's New Testament. It sounds like one of those times when the ground just opens up and swallows people, but that's, that's New Testament. We've got to hold on to that. Amen. Let me, let me find my notes. That's the only thing that happens sometimes. I lose, I lose my notes over here with, with, with this iPad. All right, I think I'm about to get back here where I was. All right, and he can be blasphemed. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven of men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven to him, but who speaks a word against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or the age to come. So again, I think people need to be a little bit careful about what they're saying about the Holy Spirit and God's teaching on it. Amen. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit here about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. What does it mean? You know, for me, I think it's the ultimate refuse, refusing the, the drawing by the Holy Spirit to salvation. You just say, no, God, I don't want that. And you're just not capable of being forgiven for that. Uh, the Holy Spirit possesses the divine attributes of the Godhead. He is eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent, and then the one I can't say, omniscient. Thank you. I have to say it like Elijah, omniscient. Um, but all the things we have, he's everywhere all at one time. He knows everything that's going on. He's every, it's, it's, it's awesome. That's why he can be, we're all, we all have the Holy Spirit living within us. Amen. Yes. He is referred to by such names as the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Promise, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Grace, and the Spirit of Life, the Spirit of Adoption, and the Spirit of Holiness. He is illustrated with such symbols as fire. It will be baptized by the Holy Ghost in fire. Yeah. And there were, there were like cloves of fire upon their tongues. Wind. He's the wind, the wind of God. Water, a seal, oil, and a dove. All of this unfolds something to some all of this unfolds something of the vast realm or sphere of the operation of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the New Testament and in the contemporary church. All right, so get into this next part. This is where it really gets good. The, the accounts and act are being rediscovered and applied. This is where we have to be. We have to be that church back in Acts. This, this, this is what we, we need Acts all over again. 
We need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We need people filled with the Holy Spirit. We need boldness. We need power. And we need to spill out of the church into the streets and get the attention of the world and let the gospel spread. Amen. All right. So let's look at this. Third, the book of Acts presides. The book of Acts provides five accounts of people receiving the fullness or infilling or baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to read these right now. In these accounts, y'all, you know, let me see. I got time to read. I got time to read. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Let's just go through these one at a time. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Um, 8, 14 through 25. That's a lot, but. Uh, now, when the, when the apostles were in Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John there, who had been... I'm not going to read all that. It's about Simon the Sorcerer, but um, I love that section of Scripture, but we'll read this more later. Um, chapter 9, 17 through 20, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying hands on him, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has come to you and sent me to you, that you may receive sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we start seeing this, just the power of the Holy Spirit, God sending people out. In these accounts, five factors were manifest. Number one, there was an overwhelming inbreaking of God's presence experienced by all who were present. There's no doubt when the Holy Spirit's being poured out, you're going to see something happen. You're going to, you're going to be impacted by it. There was evident transformation in the lives and the witnesses of the disciples who were filled. Just like, the Bible, just like the Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things are made new. You get filled with the Holy Ghost, you're a different person. There is something completely different about you. Uh, you're going to start seeing things different, hearing things different, feeling things different. And the third one, and I had a new word for myself in here, so I had to make myself a note in here. That which, that which was experienced became the impetus for the growth of the church, which means it was the force behind it was the force behind. The force behind the church growing was the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. As daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. The immediate evidence in three of the five accounts was glossolalia, which they heard him speak in tongues and magnify God. And this should be a word you're familiar with. Glossolalia is a coin term deriving from the Greek word glossa, meaning tongue, and laleo, meaning to speak. So that's, that's not a word exactly that came from the Bible, but it's two words put together, speak in tongues, glossolalia. Um, the ultimate purpose of this experience was empowered witnessing. All right, number five, I just want to hold right there. There is a purpose for being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's empowered witnessing. It's to empower us to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ to fulfill the Great Commission. I've got a note to come back onto that. But we have to understand that. Empowered witnessing and a deeper dimension of Christian commitment for the achievement of happiness, gratitude, humility, and fruitfulness. We have to have the Holy Spirit. I'm not, I can't be happy without the Holy Spirit. I can't have the gratitude that I need to thank God all the time without the Holy Spirit. Humility that we just talked about, we definitely need the Holy Spirit for that. Amen. Um, and fruitfulness. God wants us to be fruitful in every area of our life that we talked about and getting into the fruit of the Spirit that we will be discussing sometime in the near future coming up. Jerry said he wants to stick it out on Wednesday night. It's as long as I'm talking about this. I said, Jerry, I don't know how long that's going to be. It might be June. We'll, we'll see. So. We're going to have to send a helicopter to go get Jerry and bring him up here. Be daylight in June, though. Yeah, no, not June. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just have to so continue reading on here. Together, the above facts demonstrate what the present Pentecostal charismatic renewal experience. Together, the above facts demonstrate what the present Pentecostal charismatic renewal is experiencing through the Holy Spirit at work in church. At, at work in the church, right. we have to experience that. We're experiencing that here now. We're starting to see an outbreak in the Holy Spirit. We're starting to see people hungry for God, and we have to have more of that. Okay. The problem is, and I really wanted to talk about this a little bit. The problem is that too frequently the elements of this re this renewal are misunderstood or misapplied for lack of biblical understanding of tongues and the function of the gifts of the Spirit. This is what happens. I 
I've, I've tried my, I've, I've tried so much to lay a groundwork for this. What the Bible says, what happened in the world, in the world of the church, how traditions were laid, how doctrines came about, and how ultimately the baptism of the Holy Spirit just disappeared from the churches, and then how it came back into evidence in the Pentecostal revival, and it's like we've been experienced ever since, but some people are just not willing to receive it. They're just, they have, again, they have this misunderstood or misapplied for lack of biblical understanding. Amen. Again, this is why I'm giving you scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. This is why I'm in Strong's Concordance daily going through word by word by word by word by word. I mean, basically, the book of Acts, I have done a Greek word study through the entire book almost. And it's like, and I'm talking to Brenda today, and she could care less because she's working and she's supposed to be in our I'm telling her about this preposition. I said, did you honestly understand that this preposition that says in actually means by or through? And, it's, and, we, and she's like, okay, I'm working here. But, you know, I'm getting excited about a preposition because it, it, it actually defines what a praying in the Spirit means. Amen. We start talking about praying in the spirit. We start looking at that word in actually is better mean uh, by or through. So we start saying praying in the spirit was really praying by the spirit. So or praying through the spirit. So it really brings a whole other realm of understanding. But when you're just picking up a King James Bible and you're just reading these things, it's easy to make your own determination of what this stuff means. Jerry, we've had these conversations many times. It's just like when you read one of the one of the epistles and understand there was no chapters in an epistle. How many people has wrote a love letter to somebody and wrote it chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four? No, it's just a letter start to finish where people started putting in punctuation. People started putting in things in there and it kind of changes the flow and the way we read it. That's why prayer is so important when we are reading. But again, a misunderstanding and although there are varying theological and ethical viewpoints among some, some in the neo-Pentecostal charismatic movement, a common bond of unity that spirit-filled renewal is the practice of speaking in tongues, in prayer, and worship, together with an acceptance and welcoming of the operation of the Holy Spirit's gifts in their midst. And we're going to be talking more at some point about what, how Pentecostal worship came about and how our style of worship began. Amen. Can I tell you this right now? Every denomination out there right now, including the Catholic Church, is worshiping like Pentecostals. And we started it. Back in the days when the Pentecostals, somebody, and I was going to share a little bit of church history with you. Most of the churches, they were so poor they couldn't afford a piano but Cousin Fred had a banjo. So Cousin Fred learned how to play some worship music on the banjo and brought it up and somebody else found somebody who knew how to play a guitar. And they brought a guitar. And then somebody knew a drummer. Drummer, really? And about the time you started bringing drums in the church, there's other denominations. Oh, that's the devil there. They done brought drums into the church. That's the devil. And you know, but all this stuff. But you go look now. They all, that's the reason. Y'all know why I can't find musicians? I'm trying to find musicians. All these other denomination churches and Catholic churches out there are snatching them up as fast as we can because they want Pentecostal style worship in their church. But again, to, thus to fully understand this phenomenon, it is necessary to see that the Pentecostal charismatic view as they have learned to implement the book of Acts manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power workings, power workings, applying the controls taught to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, chapters 12 through 14. And we're going to be studying that. We're not going to read all that right now. So we have, to, again, has to be experienced, right? It's better experienced than explained. This is why, I mean, a lot of people come to our church and they, they enjoy they enjoy parts of it. They like the, and, you know, they like the worship. They like the, you know, loud preaching and all this stuff. You know, it's the reason, again, I was just talking to somebody. I actually, I, I was talking to Shay Sunday. I was talking to him. I said, oh, excuse me, I spit on you. I said, everyone, that's the reason everybody sits on the front pew. That's called the spit zone. <laughs> so, yeah. This, you know, people like this part. They like the upbeat. They like the loud. They like all this stuff. And I ain't getting too far because I'm going to abuse some of that in a Sunday sermon, so i got to be careful. I'm about to preach Sunday sermons to you. But there's, but when the tongue stuff starts up, 
When somebody starts speaking in tongues, all of a sudden, oh, that's out of order. I'm only going to read a little bit of this next section and we're going to be finishing up. But how can spiritual integrity be maintained? Church, we have to maintain spiritual integrity. Okay? There sometimes there can be a fine line between flesh and spirit. Some of you folks have been in Pentecostal charismatic churches. You understand exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's some teachings that I'll show you, some things that happened within the church denomination at one point in time. But first, the Pentecostal or Charismatic sees the baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit as an experience subsequent to Christian conversion after you're saved, a second work of grace. One that comes about through the process of yielding the complete person into the guidance and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We agree that the Holy Spirit is operative in every believer and the in, in the varied ministries of the church. Still, every believer must answer the question, and this is big, Acts chapter 19 and 2. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Okay, since you believed. This is a second work of grace, okay? So this is really good. Two expressions should be qualified here. It should be understood that by baptism in the Holy Spirit, the traditional Pentecostal charismatic does not refer to the baptism of the Holy Spirit accomplished at conversion, whereby the believer is placed into the body of Christ by faith in his redeeming work of the cross. Thus, no biblically oriented charismatic ever views a non-charismatic as less saved or less spiritual than himself. Okay. The baptism in which the Holy Spirit was and is directed by the Lord Jesus to be received as a gift given following his ascension. However, should any prefer to dismiss this terminology, we contend that to we contend that to experience the Holy Spirit's fullness in the spirit of unity is more important than to separate company or diminish our passion for his fullness over our differences in theological wording and practice. So this is talking about wording. By a process of yielding the complete person, the Pentecostal charismatic does not mean either A, passivity of mind, or B, a self-hypnotic or trance-like state. This is also, you need to hear this part. The Holy Spirit doesn't turn you into a zombie. Okay? You, you play an active part in this. Um... Rather, this terminology refers to an assertive, prayerful, heartfelt quest for God. The mind is active, worshiping Jesus Christ, the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. The emotions are warmed as the love of God is poured forth into our hearts. One's physical being participates as worship is spoken and expressed with upraised voice in prayer or upraised hands in adoration. Now, I'm going to stop right there tonight, but this is what we're talking about, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't let somebody tell you that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and take over your body and you're going to lose all control and you don't know what happened. All of a sudden, something took over your mind and you started speaking in tongues and you didn't know what happened. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. How many have heard that spoken in your lifetime? He will not force himself upon you and he will not force you to do anything that you are not willfully wanting to do. It can be, again... If we start thinking about it, you're praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and y'all testify with me if you can. How many people have been praying for receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and your mind is going a million miles an hour about every excuse you can think of why you're not going to do this? You can start thinking about, well, what if? What if I go to open my mouth and start speaking, and it don't sound the same way it does when Pastor Mark speaks? Doesn't matter. It's you got to open your mouth. You got to have the faith. And you got to trust. You got to be hungry for God, like it says. You got to be there wanting it and desiring the baptism of the Holy Spirit and praying for God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And literally, all we have to do is ask. All we have to do, God wants you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. God wants you to have the evidence of speaking in tongues. And it's not anything to be weird about, it's not. It's just this thing about it. You know, speaking in tongues beyond that point may never be the gift in your life, but I do believe anybody filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to develop a, a spiritual prayer language. And that may be something we're going to talk more about. That that may be something that's just reserved for you in the comfort of your home. That you may never be that person that publicly prays in the Spirit or something, but 
I believe when you embrace it and you start getting comfortable with the Holy Spirit moving in your life, you will. And we're going to talk more about, again, Pentecostal worship. We're going to talk more about praying in the Spirit, singing in the Spirit, um, just rejoicing in different things that it's not always a prophetic. But I wanted to just talk about this tonight, talk about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I wanted to give you guys some more information on this. Next week, we will start talking about the gifts of the Spirit. It's probably not going to be textbook number one, number two, number three through number nine. It's not going to be like that. We're going to talk about different things. Every person in here has a function. Every person in here, God has something he wants to do in your life. And he has a gift that, that is designed for you. And we will never be a complete body of believers without that. Amen? Amen. So tonight I want to close in prayer. I want to pray God's blessings on you. If there's anybody in this house that needs prayer wants to pray, you're invited to come down to these altars. We will pray with you as long as you need. Again, as I have said every week, if there's questions that you have, please reach out to me. I'll be more than glad to sit down with you individually and answer anything I can. Um, again, please read the verses that I gave you in all this tonight. Sit down with it. Read those verses one by one prayerfully with open hearts and open minds to see what the Lord wants to show you. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Father, we bless you and give you glory and praise tonight. We thank you for who you are and what you did and what you continue to do today, God, through us, through your church, through the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. We pray, God, for revelation. We pray, Lord, for understanding of your word and the power of the Holy Spirit moving within each of our lives. We pray, God, for those that do not understand, Lord. We just pray for an understanding. We pray for a hunger for you and for your word, Lord. We pray for a a hunger within the church to be the church that you want us to be. We pray for a, a going back to Acts, Lord. We pray to seek for the power that the first century church had. Lord, sometimes I feel like we've just got more excuses and we just use all these excuses. We go back into the first century church. They didn't have the excuses. All they had was you. All they had was the power and building of a church. We've, we've got beautiful church buildings and we've got budgets and we've got printed Bibles and we've got cars and we've got all this and and Lord, in those days, it's sometimes the only thing they could do is going into the streets, lay hands on the sick and see them healed. Go in and ask somebody, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit since you, since you were saved? So Lord, we just pray to give us the boldness that this accompanied the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. But again, I, I pray for you to stir up the hunger within your church. Let us be hungry for the things that you have planned for us, God. And we just pray, Lord, again, for those that are not here tonight, Lord, for, for anybody that goes back and watches these videos, that they will pray and they will consider and also, Lord, look for the infilling power of the Holy Ghost in their own life. So, Lord, we pray again for each one here today. Ask your blessings and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And again, if anybody, if you've got this Bible... This is where I was reading from today, the Spirit of Life Bible. If you go to the end of Revelations and turn one more page, you're exactly where we were in that. So, some great stuff in here for studying. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Well, you guys have a great night. I was trying to, trying to get finished by 8 o'clock tonight.